Well, this would be an experiment. Uh, it's hard to read this uh, 1914 uh, information of when this saxophone was built and patented. It's a busher. It was bought out by Selmer of France, Paris, France. Selmer is famous for saxophones, especially the uh, tenors. Uh, what I read here is, uh, it's called, well, the, the serial number is 143577. And uh, <clears throat> they have a, a triangle there and a tuning fork, and it's called True Tone. Uh, trademark, registered. It's, uh, they reg this saxophone is uh, registered as a low pitch bass in C. So it's basically a tenor, but one full tone up, then B flat. So it, it can sound like a tenor, and uh, most people will think, but it's because of the size of it, it's smaller. Just to go down one full step, you have to make the tenor so much bigger, uh, but that's what people like, and it does have a fuller sound, but it's not as focused as this low-pitched uh, um, C tenor. Uh, it's, it's called C melody. Now, I'm trying to read something even smaller. Um, uh, let's see, where is it? I'm trying to read is one it was the actual date it looks like oh, patent pending and all that uh, registered and okay there was actually a date now I might have to turn the sacks around to find that I don't know <laughs> uh, it's Elkhart Indiana if you can see that. Oh my goodness. The saxophone. A melody, just gonna have to put up with me. It says uh, Busher. The Busher, it's called The Busher. So this saxophone is uh, was so good that Selmer bought it. They don't, you can't find a busher anymore made in, in Elkhart, Indiana. Um, I know that it says December 8th, 1914, and that's what I'm looking for now, is that actual date. Oh, I see it. But I don't know if the camera will be in the camera. Uh, see, it's actually up here. It says, uh, uh, let me get this, I don't know if you can see it. Right here, uh, above this uh, uh, little frame for the key, it says, uh, well, you might be able to see it. Uh, Uh, it's uh, December 8th, 1914. Yeah, I'll move it this way a little bit more, get more light on it. 1914. The 4 is kind of uh, worn. But by the time it goes through the process of uh, enlarging it on the screen, because uh, I'm looking through a real tiny uh, half an inch by a three quarter inch screen and I have to use a, a magnifying glass uh, get this other one here uh, it's a little bit better so it's like below the serial number which is a 143577 uh, then it says it has a it has both the tuning fork and a triangle uh, so they 
they really try to get uh, in, in focus and, and, and in tune with itself, and it's uh, based in C instead of B flat. So they have to do some things. Uh, but after this uh, model, the Buescher, uh, and after Selmer bought it, uh, it they stopped making uh, C melodies. They went, everything is in B flat or E flat now which uh, I started on the saxophone in E flat and I had a horrible time, oh, a horrible time. I couldn't tell what the hell key to pick when, uh, when the others are, you know, what key the others were in. I, I would know that, but what would it be on the sax? So I suffered with that because I, I'm not like that. I'm organic. Uh, I'm just natural. Whatever God made me to be, is what I am. But it definitely says December 8th, 1914, and you might even catch a bit of that four. What I see is on the left side where it has a little peak, I see the four. But where the, where the straight line of the four goes down, that's been worn quite a bit. All right, well, that's basically that. The other one is brand new, uh, and it's in B-flat. Like I said, they don't make Cs anymore. Um, <clears throat> the reason why I, I like C is because I'm, I'm basically a flute player, uh, and I started on recorder, which is in C. So, and then I took th music theory on the piano, and that's all C. <laughs> I don't think, and now B-flat, I played trumpet for a while, and I knew that if the other guys are playing in C, I would have to go to D and play you know, in D. And uh, it's the same thing I'm, I'm going to have to do with my little, my new soprano. Uh, I'm going to get the soprano over there. Uh, the soprano's a cute one, you know. And it's, I like the way that they made the silver with the gold keys. I think that's very beautiful. Let me get the stand out of here. <clears throat> so it's uh, very lovely. Uh, I like the gold on, on the silver. And this is uh, <coughs> called a slade. Let me find out where the, uh, there it is. Slade, and I don't know how they, you know, uh, there's a slade. Do you see that? Oh, I have a little more up here. Uh, slade. I just can't get the right angle, and I don't see it too well. I have my glasses on. I have, to, I have to use two glasses. But basically, it's a slade. Uh, that's the company. It's a made, and it says designed by USA instead of um, uh, how they say uh, design, not designed. It, that's a weird word. Uh, by USA. Maybe designed in USA. Um, and patented it, and you, I don't know. They just uh, have a weird way of saying designed by USA. <laughs> uh, is it really designed by USA, or is it designed by people? <clears throat> anyway, and it's it's pretty nice. It's got the um, these pearl um, the pearl keys are really quite nice, and it, it, it's a lot of a lot of nice things here. The only thing is that <coughs> this key here gets stuck. Let me see if I can get it in the lift position. See if you can see that. Uh, shoot. See this key here? See it lift. It's supposed to lift open. Well, sometimes it gets stuck. And it's because there's a rod with the the head of it, and it's not uh, Phillips, it's straight. Uh, 
Let me show if you can see the movement. I tried to show this before, but that is the problem with this. If it stays open, then it's not going to, the airflow is not going to go down to the bell of the saxophone. You know, it's going to be, um, yeah, there's, there you can see it moving. It's going to be stuck like that. And even a small amount, a hair difference, uh, uh, it would leak there. And uh, it's hard to play in the lower register, any upper register past that particular key, which is this one here, you know. Anything past that is, of course, you're going to be all right. But, um, basically, that's how sax works. The longer the tube, the lower the note. If it escapes higher than that, you know, the higher point, you're not going to be able to get your low end to, to resonate and to develop, you know. It's going to be leaking through there. And it screws you up. That is what's wrong with this uh, brand new Slade. And I think what they did, in my opinion, <coughs> what they did wrong is that whole area there, the rod is just too long. And uh, uh, let's see if I can get that again. Where is that? Uh, where's that? Oh, there it is, okay. Yeah, the rod is too long. There's a rod there. If I can get if I can get the movement, I'll be all right. See that movement? That rod that holds that whole assembly uh, next to it. You can see that this the screw sneaking. See? Uh, the, snoo the screw, or the, actually a rod, with a, a normal uh, screwdriver head, not a Phillips. Anyway, so that rubs up against the, the, the beginning of uh, that key. Uh, I think you should be able to see it. I mean, I'm having a hard time because I'm trying, trying my best to show you that. But that rod right there is too close. It rubs. And I, I had a hard time trying to push the rod in, away from that key. Uh, I found the smallest screwdriver I had, but still, the key is so close to that, the end of that rod that rod should have gone in further away from that key and with plenty of clearance. That's the way it's done in Elkhart, Indiana. This is in China. This was made in China with a name like Slade. <laughs> uh, but other than that, it's very pretty and I will fix that. I don't care if I have to file it down or something or take it to a specialist. I could probably do that. <laughs> But I don't know anybody in Castleberry that works on woodwinds. Uh, yeah, I just don't. But now, if I put it like this, you can see where it's rubbing. Hopefully you can. Yeah. Make sure that magnifying glass helps in this case. But if I get the camera close enough, And get the movement because I can I, I lose it uh, I lose sight of it so that's where the rod is just right next to that you know and it just uh, it makes the person uh, look like a fool you know <laughs> because even though you, I've played soprano sax and in the uh, 80s with Caoba and Canela and, uh, and regular sax and with Queen's Band in the 70s, you know. <laughs> this right here is a problem for me because I, I, I prefer to have a real quality, in, to intonate it 
instrument and a good tone. It does have a chunky tone. I do like that about it. Um, it's a good B flat uh, uh, instrument, you know. And it, it's a little bit bigger, so you can get lower fundamentals. And uh, the the instruments that are in B flat apparently have a fuller sound, but they're looser. They're like the Busher is a focused type of tenor. Has a real forceful sound. Uh, a tenor is looser because it's just bigger, you know. Uh, you know, loose fit. I'm not quite saying that, but uh, the bigger the instrument, like a tuba, the fatter the note and the looser, slower frequencies are in there, you know. Uh, where if you have a tight, focused type of smaller instrument, you know, like the soprano sax is definitely more focused and uh, uh, kind of has an edge to it that penetrates where the tenor doesn't, unless you get a metal mouthpiece and, you know, a certain, a certain type of reed that could fit it and to get your sound out of it. And you can get it to have that edge. There's a lot of people that have, that play good uh, edgy kind of uh, tenors, you know. Uh, they have all the treble they need. <laughs> uh, and then there's, you have your Wayne Shorters, which is a, a full, fuller sound. Uh, there's nothing wrong with his tone, you know. Wayne Shorter is my favorite. Uh, well, besides Coltrane, but Coltrane was the quickness and uh, the exactness of his scales because he practiced every night on that bridge in Brooklyn, I believe, uh, <clears throat> night after night, uh, and in all the keys. And he made sure that he could play anything in any key, which is the the goal of a jazz uh, musician. Uh, and that's basically that. I thought I'd make this video to, uh, so you guys can uh, <laughs> understand my dilemma. And uh, other than that, um, you know, I'm not, I'm a, I'm a, my foundation is guitars. You know, my dad made the guitars by hand, uh, acoustic guitars. Um, I'm his son, and I tend to be more into the electric guitars, and that's what I specialize on. Uh, I do custom work, custom job. You know, I, I, I find research uh, the type of things you could do uh, for Strat type guitars or Les Paul type guitars, and I, I find the things that, that need to go on there. Uh, all my guitars have uh, uh, that black. Uh, Even Jennifer has a black nut. And Jennifer, oh, I might as well explain Jennifer. <clears throat> now, Jennifer, uh, yeah, I probably have to move this camera, but I don't want to. See, Jennifer has a graphite knot, gra graph tech. See, now she also has Grovers because the junk that PV puts, this is a PV guitar, it's made in China to boot. So it had clunkers, man. It had that Clouson Deluxe stamp steel shit. <laughs> it's not even covered. I mean, dust and all kinds of crap can go in it. You know, now, so it's a graphite knot. Uh, Gaff Tech, Grover Tuners. Now that's custom enough. The frets are beautiful on this. Uh, the other, the other job is that um, this is an eighth inch uh, Alnico, 22 pole. All right, it's got its own switch. This one here is a quarter inch of Alnico for leads, and it's got a huge field. And it's sweet. I mean, I can't believe a powerful pickup like that can be so sweet. It's got its own switch. In the center, it's humbucker. Coil A is more like acoustical, high endy, and uh, coil B is strat-like, uh, more electric sounding. And uh, you could combine them, put one in uh, 
Coral A, or the other one Coral B. I found some nice tones that way. Or one in humbucker mode, and the other one, whatever. It adds up to a, about the same as uh, Christina, which has 15, because she's got one humbucker, which is an Allen Holdsworth. It has all all the poles on, on a Allen true a Allen Holdsworth pickup is uh, screwables. No studs. This one has studs, but this is the classic design. Uh, I'll bring, I'll bring, uh, uh, damn, I got the, this, shoot. I hope I don't move the camera too much, but, yeah. What happened was, uh, the strap got stuck. All right, so that's one thing. Uh, the uh, other thing you'll notice about Jennifer is that everything's custom on it. There's chrome knobs, I put them on. The switches, I put them on. And I did this work myself. So that's how into uh, electric guitars I am. It has no vibrato. <laughs> and that's a stop piece, uh, tail piece. <clears throat> it weighs 10 pounds of <laughs> pure basswood. <laughs> um, now, I'll show you Christina different animal all together. Christina, she has that uh, grab tech and it's slimmer because strats are that way. It fits in that channel with the, uh, I didn't show that. Les Paul type guitars are more like an acoustic guitar. It's put at the end. See that? See how it's put at the end of the fretboard? And it, it really relies on, on the type of glue that you use. <clears throat> Not so with Strat type guitars. Also, the string trees, the first thing I got was string trees. I hated the way those metal pieces of shit. Stamp steel sucks. So I, I, that's the first thing I bought was a Graf Tech string trees for Strat. Now that headstock was six in line, but I hate it. I get lost and I retune stuff and I detune other stuff and I just, it gets me pissed. Okay, this and the other thing is it doesn't have, this one has a hole like that, but I like it. It's a simple design you can get at the truss rod, very easy. I had to, I had to do all the rounding off of the frets on this guitar because somebody just cut them to size Slapped them on and, and took it, to, uh, put it in a, in a little cart to go to Guitar Center, uh, Manchester, uh, New Hampshire, where I was. All right, and uh, it's a bolt on neck. Now, this is the, the real reason why I got Christina over here is that Christina has authentic Allen Holdsworth pickups. Notice every single pole, all 22 on the humbucker, are screw of balls. understand? And on the single coils, it's all screwables, except they have 11 per coil. Even the humbuckers has 11 per coil. Um, these came, Christina came with chrome knobs, which I like, and uh, she had a white uh, lever tip, you know, uh, selector tip. The, the tip of it was white and it just, everything else is black and red, you know, and, and this thing just, uh, it always, you know, she just didn't, couldn't stand it, you know, yeah, give me a black one, I said, you know, she likes the black, okay. So that's, uh, that's Christina. This guitar cost me $99 because somebody did not do the frets right. They didn't round off the frets. They didn't doctor the frets, you know, like they're supposed to. You can't sell a guitar like that and then somebody, a, ch a child can grab it and get, would get cut, bloody hands, you know. Uh, anyway, <laughs> that's the situation. One, one humbucker, one three position switch. But that combination, if I put it here and I put it in coil A, it's going to sound more acoustic like. The instant I put it into coil B, it has a strat electrifying driving kind of sound. 
That's the main difference. And in, of course, if you want a fatter, chunkier sound, you just put it, leave it in the middle. And that, that it's all, that's called, it's called coil tapping. This whole switch is just tapped into this whole general circuitry of this guitar. And that's why it works like that. Uh, I'm not selecting anything, I'm just uh, tapping into the circuitry of it. When, it doesn't matter which pickup you put on it, right? It's gonna, the electricity works, works a certain way, you know. And uh, of course, I slam a lot. So you can see the wear and tear on the screw heads, but I don't care. It's part of my style. And uh, it goes back to the 70s, the way I play. I've, I've heard plenty of recordings of mine that have that chirp. And that's me. That's Ned Burgess. All my guitars are that way. Uh, Paul Reed Smith. Paul Reed Smith. Where are the screwables? Where? The two center ones, because I can chirp, I can slam. If you put them over here, then all, all I got is plastic. You can't slam against plastic. It just, you get a thud, all right? So, now, <clears throat> I didn't want to customize my PRS, and she's Emily, but when the other girls, you know, are, are all this GravTech stuff, and I found out that they made, uh, GravTech made one, uh, uh, you know, bridge saddles for uh, PRS. I said, whoa, I'll get that. And then, uh, I realized that uh, PRS ha has always had graph tech type, but it's chunkier, it's fatter, thicker, you know. Um, take a look at the difference. Very detailed work. Whoever says that, that uh, musicians are lazy or stupid, they're, uh, they just, they don't observe, you know. Do you see what I'm saying? that that, the PRS, is way chunkier of a nut than the way the Fender does it. So, that's what I, I can say. Now, Lunita, let me go to Tone, she's also got GravTech nut. And to boot, she's got stock, her stock <laughs> tuners, but they're great. Luna makes sure that that works. All right. Now, I, and I wanted to get originally. I wanted to get the black graph tech, which is uh, designated by the rhinoceros. But uh, I, I couldn't find it, and they said, "Well, we have uh, man-made ivory, so it's the same thing. It's still graph tech." So I got the man-made ivory, and it has an elephant on it to designate this man-made ivory. And these dots, I wanted them to be uh, bolder, you know, like black, tend to be black or a dark color or brown, but it, it's a, like a silver. But it's all right, it's Lunita. And she's got that spalted top. There's no reflection there, none. Because that's a special spray that you put on paintings by artists so it doesn't reflect nothing. You just see what's inside, underneath that finish that you put on it, and you spray it on, and all, 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 any reflection is canceled automatically. In fact, oh, I'll show you. If you do this to any other guitar, you will not hear that because it's lacquer. Right, but with Lunita being spalted and then having that thing on that spray I to tell you about, that's what happened. Uh, but I love her; she's my pride and joy. And I have been neglecting her, and I've done two videos of my neglect. And then I last last jam thing, I was just rusty on her because acoustic guitars perform different. 
you know, they do. They, uh, they're stiffer, they, uh, <laughs> it's a wound third string, G string, you know, instead of a, a, a plain one. Uh, it's just a totally different animal when it comes to playing it. You gotta have strong hands. So I get, I get the uh, very lightest, I start at 10 with acoustic. With electrics, it's a, not a double O nine, uh, so that's that's my my setup. All right. Well, I think I've it's gone thirty minutes. Uh, that's about uh, my limit for these kind of things, unless it's real super technical. Um, but I think I covered a lot. I covered the woodwinds, except for the flute. <laughs> uh, this is a Yamaha flute. The name Yamaha, you can see. They got some interesting things, like you know, how do you tune a flute for here, an armature? You see, it's got the, uh, the the symbol, which is actually three tuning forks. That <clears throat> that uh, triangle there uh, has a point that paint, it points to this triangle, right? You see that? So when you, when they both facing each other, it's in tune, you know, you roll the flute, like. Um, this particular flute is uh, the uh, triple two Yamaha. It's intermediate. I have a professional flute that it needs to go to the shop. It's been, it's seen six years of hard work. It's established in 18, 1887. That's when it was established, Yamaha. And I love Yamaha. And this is an intermediate, intermediate flute, and I can get my low notes, and you know, I, that's what suffered on my other, my professional flute, is it was starting to leak, leaky pads, right? And they didn't close right, they're not lined up. So <clears throat> that's when I noticed, ah, now I gotta put this one in a shop. And I did up in New, in New Hampshire, both my sax and the, uh, and the flute, the good flute, uh, the Yamaha also, uh, they were both in the shop being refurbished. When I got it back, they were in excellent mint shape. Um, well, the sax has to go to a specialist in Castleberry. I'm not gonna go out of town. You know, I like Castleberry, and that's where I've made my life here for the, since 19, uh, no, since the year 2000 when I came here. I came here with a band uh, named Thread, and uh, Thread disbanded. Uh, the bass player got married, and he was one of the key people. And uh, Ted uh, was too young, you know, 19 or so, but a, so a fairly solid drummer. He he's not consistent, but we still had some funny songs. And we had that ability to make up songs and words and everything. All of us did, <laughs> out of nowhere, you know. So that um, the one that's uh, bluesy, uh, hillbilly boy, uh, uh, bluesy country boy. You know, I forget the damn name of the tune, but. Uh, Bluesy hillbilly boy, uh, hillbilly man or something. But anyway, you'll probably see that uh, that video. It's uh, that's the one thread song that's totally improvised. And also, uh, won't you try? Won't you try? The the version with thread is totally made up on the spot, and and yet it's one of the tunes that became uh, one of mine. But it really is thread uh, because that's the energy, uh, Ted on drums, and uh, um, Jimmy on bass, and, or guitar, because he played them both, acoustic guitar or bass. And, uh, you know, he, I think on that one he was playing acoustic guitar, but he had a deep sound. <clears throat> it sounded good. Um, bluesy Hillbilly Boy, I think is what it is. Um, and it talks about his dog, you know, uh, Blue Tick Hound, you know, it's a funny tune, but <clears throat> that song was totally, is totally improvised, uh, and also um, uh, Won't You Try uh, was totally improvised, but now I've formulated it, and it's more consistent. 
Well, I have to say good night because uh, uh, I'm at, this is a nightmare. Uh, it's 11.05. Uh, God bless everyone.